Today we're popping up the hood of America's Middle East policies, because there's some fresh smoke coming from areas we previously considered fixed. Uh oh, that darn check morality lights flashing again. Now the question of the day is, who can we legally shoot at right now and how can we legally shoot at them? America's current wars are governed by a patchwork of permission slips that were passed by Congress. The major limit constraining who you can shoot at right now is how good your lawyer is. Not particularly hard considering that ISIS doesn't currently have a defense attorney on retainer. So gather around everyone because it's story time. In 2001, 7 days after September 11th, the executive branch got the ultimate permission slip from Congress, the 2001 authorization for the use of military force. Now, This authorization released the hounds of the military industrial complex and allowed us to go after any groups or individuals related to 9-11. With that, Bush got at his red yarn conspiracy theory board and found connections to 9-11 all across the globe. The Philippines? 9-11. Djibouti, Yemen and the Horn of Africa? Uh, 9-11. The Eastern European country of Georgia? Well, let's get our combat troops over there before Russia has a chance, because you guessed it, 9-11. In fact, I have an intelligence report right here saying that Kevin Bacon was connected within 7 degrees of 9-11. This also gave Bush the authority to invade Afghanistan, because the Taliban were harboring bin Laden, who, you know, 9-11. It's still on the books today and used to justify new engagements with all sorts of groups. ISIS? Sure they emerged 14 years after 9-11, but if those jerks had a time machine they would have done it. Just gonna round up a bit and lump them in. Now there was one pesky group that America just couldn't get the 9-11 label to stick to. Iraq. So what do you do when you really want to invade a country but even your best intelligence is saying, I don't know what to tell you man, they just didn't do 9-11. I'm sorry? Well you could either give up or you could go back to congress and ask for another permission slip. Enter the 2002 authorization for the use of military force in Iraq. Now the difference between this and previous invasions we talked about in this episode was that, in this case, we were going against the government of Iraq. When we sent troops into the Philippines for example, we weren't fighting the Philippines, we were fighting against an insurgency that was happening in the Philippines. Well now in 2002, we were going up against the head honcho himself, Saddam Hussein, and we were authorized to use all armed forces we had to do so. Now a debate in congress has just started as to whether we should repeal this invade Iraq authorization. It would be a huge victory for anyone who didn't want to see the Iraq wars turn into a trilogy. Unfortunately though, this would be more of a preventative measure than something that would end any of America's current engagements. The Biden administration states that the United States has no ongoing military activities that rely solely on this 2002 authorization for use of military force as a domestic legal basis, and that to repeal it would likely have minimal impact on current military operations. It's a bit more like, if someone who hasn't smoked in 18 years announces, that's it, I'm giving up smoking for my health. I mean, yeah, good choice, probably shouldn't start doing that again, but don't expect a huge pat on the back for announcing it. Maybe start reining in some of the other unhealthy activities you're doing right now. American forces are still in Iraq today, but now it's not under that 2002 mandate, but rather because insurgencies have popped up that, you guessed it, we can die to 9-11. You start writing in then that 2001 resolution and I'll give you an entire episode. Now keep this 2002 resolution debate in the back of your mind because it makes a major comeback at the end of this episode. So for years after that America continued its above board shadow wars, seeing new 9-11 perpetrators popping up all across the globe. At one point a few American troops were killed in Niger because 9-11. And we found out just how little lawmakers knew about the military forces we had authorized. Wait, we invaded that country? 
Man, it's so hard to keep track of this stuff. Things stayed pretty unstably stable. The next big call in the lawyer moment happened when America decided it wanted to bomb Libya without congressional approval. The logic here was, bombing alone doesn't constitute war, so we don't need congressional approval to drop bombs on people that we can't really associate with 9-11. Now this new theory emerged under Nobel Peace Prize winner Barack Obama. Must have been a slow year for peace. Obama's Office of Legal Counsel created a new two-step test for America to legally bomb foreigners without the OK from Congress. First, does the president reasonably determine that the military action in question serves an important national interest? In Obama's memo arguing that the president could duck Congress and start bombing the government of Libya on their own, he cited two interests, preserving regional stability and supporting the United Nations Security Council's credibility and effectiveness. Because nothing screams preserving regional stability like bombing the recognized government of a country without a follow up plan in place. Now the second test here was. Ok, so the president has determined that there is a state interest in bombing a country. But like, what kind of bombs and attacks are we talking? Boots on the ground? Huh, that's messy. Gonna have to get out the old red yarn and connect them to 9-11 if you want to do that. If you want to hug bombs from a distance though, well I can work with that. The Office of Legal Counsel opined that some air and missile strikes do not pass the threshold of war in the second prong. This legal invention really put the bomb in Obama. And with that, America was in a whole new world of legal combat minutia, engaging in shootouts with groups across the world because 9-11, and flying overhead dropping bombs on different groups and governments across the world because I'm the gosh darn president and I don't need a note to do it. It's not a war if I punch you, only if you punch me back. Now this new touch of war legal justification began sanctioning bombings without congressional permission slips. What are you gonna do, sue us on behalf of Muammar Gaddafi? This new school of justification continued when President Trump launched missile strikes against the government of Syria. Oh yeah, remember that time in 2017 when we all gawked at those missile launches like they were a 4th of July display? Woohoo! We're bombing air bases in Syria! Wait, ISIS doesn't control air bases in Syria. Uh, we just bombed Assad, who, let me check really quickly, didn't do 9 11. The Trump administration identified their own rationale for striking Syria without reaching out to Congress. The promotion of regional stability, starting to think presidents slapped that one out to pad their strike justification numbers. If we bomb Syria's government a little bit, that'll be the glue that brings everyone over there together. The prevention of a worsening of the region's humanitarian catastrophe and the deterrence of the use and proliferation of chemical weapons. This was, after all, an airstrike in response to Assad using chemical weapons against his people, so that makes a fair amount of sense. As far as the second question of scale went though, Trump's justification could have been just copy pasted over from Obama's Libya justification. Given the absence of ground troops, the limited mission and time frame, and the efforts to avoid escalation, the anticipated nature, scope, and duration of these airstrikes did not rise to the level of a war for constitutional purposes. A similar explanation was given in the bombing that killed Qasem Soleimani. So this brings us to today and Biden, because in the background of Middle East policy, the United States is engaging in a whole new bombing campaign that's starting to pick up speed. And let me tell you, it's against a group that didn't do 9-11. I was wondering how long it would take Iran to show up in this episode. America's current strategy of bombing Iranian back proxies is really just straddling that line as to what is and isn't a war. 
The administration's current cited national interest is deterring Iran from attacking our troops, as those troops crack down on the people we can pin 9-11 on. Unfortunately, there is an escalating back and forth between the United States and Iranian-backed militia groups, which have stepped up attacks on US forces in recent months, despite Biden's stated goal of deterrence through retaliatory airstrikes. Now, this might all seem pretty weird to you viewers, but there is a real solid difference between a one-off bombing, we sure did show that Syrian airbase who's who, and an ongoing and expanding set of bombings. Oh, this? It's not a war. I just need a bunch more bombs quick because we're under attack. Remember, under the legal framework created by Obama, there were two steps to the test. First, is there a national interest? And second, this thing is starting to look a bit too much like a war, right? Some of the proposals for a future Biden anti-Iran bombing campaign are starting to look and quack a bit too close for comfort like a duck. In prong 2, the Office of Legal Counsel examines the risk that an initial strike will escalate into a broader conflict, a possibility reflected in the president's public warnings concerning Iranian retaliation and a pledge to respond to any such attacks. Now, consensus opinion right now seems to be the president's, you send one of mine to the hospital, I send one of yours to the morgue approach, is covered under Obama and Trump's interpretation of Article 2 powers, limited bombings in the furtherance of a national interest. The debate now is about potential offensive operations. Biden's Democratic allies argue that the president does not have the authority to launch offensive strikes against the Iranian-backed militia groups without first seeking new congressional approvals. Need another permission slip to do that. But with these response bombings, they argue that the president is acting within his Article 2 powers under the Constitution to defend United States service members by retaliating. Republicans, on the other hand, well, they seem a little less concerned about how the sausage is getting made and a little more concerned with bombing Iran in whatever form it might come in. Let's not make it harder for the president to turn up the heat on the Iranians. Proactively bomb their proxies. We won't put up a fight. Now, the debate over the legality of a potential future Biden bombing strategy is seeping into that earlier congressional proposal to end the 2002 Iraq invasion permission slip. Senate Republicans are arguing that repealing the 2002 and 1991 Iraq war authorizations would send a dangerous message to the Iran-backed militia groups that continue to strike American positions in Iraq. Now, the Republicans are currently gift wrapping an argument for Biden that would allow him to circumvent Congress with this 2002 statute. You know, when we granted Bush the authority to fight against threats emanating from Iraq, we didn't specify the Iraqi government. Those Iranian proxy forces are within the borders of Iraq, so if you wanted to, I don't know, you could use that argument to use ground forces to go after them, despite the fact that they didn't do 9-11. Didn't hear it from me. This interpretation of that 2002 statute would expand Biden's opportunities from using just the Obama legal construct to conduct limited airstrikes on Iranian proxies without Congress to allowing him to claim Congress gave him full authority in 2002 to attack any threats in the geographical Iraq with complete forces that we used to bring down Saddam Hussein. Don't even have to tie him to 9-11. Senator Ted Cruz just introduced an amendment to the repeal measures that would preserve the president's ability to attack Iran and its proxies in Iraq. At that point, not really sure what you're repealing. So that's the long and strange evolution of the executive and legislative branches duking it out over conducting the war on terror. If you're curious what it looks like when members of Congress sue the executive branch to try and end a combat action that they didn't approve, well, I made an episode on the court case of Campbell v. Clinton, when Congress tried to end American bombing involvement in Kosovo by taking Bill Clinton to court. 
congressmen generally lose these suits based on a lack of standing, as either the bombing campaign has ended so the court doesn't need to render a decision, or the court points to alternate remedies, such as Congress's ability to defund those operations, repeal authorizations of force, or issue a directive telling the president to cease certain combat operations. Basically, the courts have not ruled out the possibility that a conflict over the use of force between Congress and the president could require judicial resolution, but they have thus far deemed the matter to be one for the political branches to resolve on their own. Check out that episode if you want to learn more. Thank you and please make this all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, here's that Campbell v Clinton link I promised you. Thank you to my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, click on that link in the description. Like, subscribe, and do all that other fun YouTube stuff. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.